Hello, my delicious co-creators. Lilu here. We're in London. Oh, my God. Hello, William. Hello, Lilu. Thank you for having me. I'm enjoying, you know, this is great because there are so many people on this spiritual path I've interviewed for many years, and I haven't interviewed you yet. So it's exciting because, you know, whatever is going to come out of this interview, I know it will be fresh and new. You're used to do many interviews and many videos, and you're a guy I'm host and right. etc. So I want to get out of the box and get something right. a bit different than what you usually do. Okay. I know you're very interested about neuroscience and ascension, so I want to get in there in the light body and the art and how we can really profoundly ascend and feel uh, totally vibrant. I guess it's at the core of your topic, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, the idea of ascension, not idea, the whole process really has been a focal point of my research for at least 10 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, started in the 90s writing about uh, extraterrestrials and ancient history, went through all that phase, and then realized that there's a missing part of that whole conversation, and mm. it's about why did these gods, angels, extraterrestrials come to Earth? And the answer seemed to focus on they're here to help us, to assist us in our transformation and our ascension to become a cosmic species. And so I started devoting all of my research time to looking into those questions, how did they do this, and what does it mean to us today? Yeah. Because we hear a lot that there was those ancient civilization, and uh, you know, we talked, we hear about Atlantis, Lemurians, and all that, yeah. and extraterrestrial. And as you said, they seem to want to share some information with us. But where where did this knowledge go back then? Uh, we hear that it went to Egypt, and uh, you know where. Well, yeah, you're right. There's a, there's definitely a timeline too, where you have the pre-flood world, the Atlantean world, where there was clearly ascension teachings. There was interaction with otherworldly beings, extraterrestrials. Then it's lost. The Egyptian civilization recovers it. The Sumerians were well aware of this idea. Really picked up uh, steam, if you will, around 600 BC to 300 BC, where people are starting to get this idea. Wait a minute. We we have the ability to transform. We can become like the gods. Mm. We can travel the stars. We have supernatural capabilities just like they possessed. In fact, that's par probably why they came here, was to assist us in awakening those potentials within us. And so we followed that, that timeline through the, the time of the Essenes, just before Jesus. The, the Christian mystics were all about ascension. And then we lose it again until the time of the Cathars, yeah. 13th century. They're all about ascension and attaining the light body. Yeah. And then we lose it again. And now here we are reclaiming these lost teachings that really aren't lost. They've just gone underground for a time. And now it's, it's coming back around. I've got shivers. That's a light body uh, tingling or what? Yeah, it's a light body saying, yeah, 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 that's, uh, that's what it's all about. Yeah, it feels right. So why do we lose it and, and go back after it? Is, it? is it a question of power not handling all this? Or is it really because the circumstances and the universe is all of a sudden not able to, to handle or cope well, with the situation? It, it is really a combination of both things. It's cosmic timing, although people can ascend anytime they want. Some people think that there has to be a, a group ascension, that, that it's only possible for people to ascend in mass but actually the history shows that individuals have been ascending on their own for a very long time. But what you've got, unfortunately, in, in this world of duality that we inhabit is the forces of light versus the, the forces of darkness, and they don't want us to go beyond no. this realm. They so want that's it. a reality, the darkness, and the, because some, some people say talk about unity, and finally in the darkness there is light. So there is truly those, those, this war going on, this duality in the universe? It, there is, and... One way that that's expressed today is with the emergence of technology. We are now beginning to merge with artificial intelligence, merge with, with machines. And the question is, can a transhuman ascend? And that's a, a very important question because more and more people are, are merging with their technology. And personally, I advise try to stay away from it as much as possible because I think it could, in fact, hinder our ascension. And that's not to say that people involved with technology are dark forces or negative entities, but it, I don't think it's going to be a, a positive scenario for us. But how about back then in the ancient time, what happened then? They didn't have the technology. So what was the dark force like, look like? Um, well, back then you had priesthoods that, that continued to, to just withhold this knowledge. They mm -hmm. just felt like they were the ones that had to stand in between us and, and the cosmic realm, in between us and our true spirituality. And this is what a lot of your, I call them ascension keepers, uh, this is a, the, the title of my new show on Gaia that comes out in October 2019, 
where we look at these various groups who possess this knowledge and realize that they're, they're always presented as rebels, mm -hmm. mainstream, traditional religion and spirituality of any current time views anybody on the ascension path as a rebel. And that's part of the, the change that has to occur. We have to flip away from that and make ascension more mainstream and make resistance to it rebellious. Mm. So this information, how, why now are we back into, why all of a sudden we feel as close as we've ever been to realizing, and even some people have an amazing out-of-body experiences, can travel through time, right. be in different places at different times. Mm -hmm. Why is this possible now? Well, I think it's, this is still part of that 2012 moment. That window was not a, a single day or a very short period of time. It's a whole window of time that we are in now. And it was all about transformation. And so we are now in this time of transformation. And with the advent of communications and technology that enables us to, to share this information, now more and more people are tuning in. Yeah. Is, is it a matter of, of uh, portals of, of light of, uh, or in the universe are opening up? Or is it already written? Because, of course, we've heard of all those prophecies, including right. the Mayas. But right. is there, I mean, this, these are special times. Be right. Yeah, I think so, and I, I do subscribe to the belief that we are moving into an area of the galaxy where the, the energy, the frequency is, is higher, making it more conducive to this type of consciousness, and so that's a very important part of it. And I think it's also just a, a natural flow as well, that the, it seems that uh, when you look at the timeline of ascension, that about every 12, 1400 years, there's this huge movement, this upsurgence in in. Uh, a quest for ascension, and that's the time that we're in now. Mm. Is there is there something to get ready? I mean, I know you're you're a lot through uh, imagery and uh, and those uh, iconic uh, paintings, etc. Yeah. It's kind of I I I, I heard here to what to ignite something within. So. Yeah, the idea is we need a we need a target. We need to know what is our future self going to look like. And that, in part, is what the, the sacred art provides for us, is a, is a model. There's many examples of, of avatars, both male and female, that are in the light body. But the real key thing about the sacred art is that the presence, and this is the belief going back many thousands of years, actually, is that this art is intentionally created by the artist to be a conduit, to be a portal, so that this divine being, this avatar, be it... Jesus or Padmasambhava from the Tibetan tradition or any other figure is literally spiritually present in the painting. And the painting then becomes a conduit through which this mm -hmm. avatar can transmit their presence mm -hmm. or their vibration to the person that's perceiving it. Mm -hmm. And this is how the quote unquote codes, the ascension codes are transmitted primarily is through the art. Mm -hmm. For example, when the Dalai Lama goes to learn about the great perfection of the rainbow light body process, which is a uh, a spiritual technique where the, the flesh and blood body dissolves into five colored rainbow light, leaving behind only hair, toe, and fingernails, which have no nerves to be transmuted, and then can travel the stars in a light body form. Well, when the Dalai Lama goes to learn how to do that, including the present Dalai Lama, there are no books, there are no texts that describe how to do this. It's all presented visually. Mm -hmm. The images show us how to do it. What makes it sacred? Because I guess then every kind of artist can say, I'm doing sacred work. We hear about sacred rituals, ceremonies, etc. We kind of put this word a bit everywhere now right. these days. Yeah. So what makes that picture sacred and why uh, photography cannot do the same? Well, you know, here's the thing is that maybe all art is in fact sacred. Maybe all art is in fact a conduit. It's not just this special particular piece, although there are some that are considered more special than others, but all art potentially could have this capability of being a conduit to the divine realm. Mm. In including pictures of avatars. Including pictures of avatars. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, this is something that's really sometimes difficult to get our imagination around how, first of all, a painting can be a portal and how even a photo of a painting can be a portal. But that's the fact of the matter because we live in a quantum universe. And through quantum entanglement, we are entangled with these avatars. We are all together at one time and therefore we can be in instantaneous communication with them whether or not they're on another planet next door or in another dimension. 
Yeah, that's, that's very interesting because I remember, I think it was Dolores Cannon, interviewed Dolores Cannon back then when she was still alive and she was talking about uh, being, um, how in past lives, you know, how we can get to past lives and some of us have see each other as Jesus or Joan of Arc or, you know, and how can there be 10,000 Jesus or Joan of Arc? And she was saying that we can be impregnated, our soul can decide to uh, kind of go through this life to have more knowledge in this lifetime. So we could have been several to live that. Is that something you... Yeah, that's part of it. But also in the in the principle of entanglement, if, if there was a Big Bang, and a lot of people think there was, all matter in the universe was, was one mm -hmm. in the very beginning. So that means we're entangled. Mm -hmm. Everybody has the potential to be in connection with any of these avatars anywhere. And, and, and so that means we have the good and the bad. If there is a light body, we have a dark body too? Well, yeah, and that's our flesh and blood body, no. according to this teaching. <laughs> the, the, the flesh and blood body is not evil, but it is considered a counterfeit counterpart to the light body. Mm -hmm. And so we get very attached to this body. I mean, if you Google the word perfect body, you're going to see some either man or a woman, a male or a female, that has this unobtainable body. Yeah. Right, unless you've got maybe 100,000 pounds, you can go to a London plastic surgeon and you know get some work done. That's our definition of perfect. But to the ancients, the perfect body was the light body, and everybody has a light body. So it's just a, a matter of our focus. Where do we put our attention? Are we putting it on the outside or on the inside? Yeah, and there is the emotions, and there is the personality and the identity that we seem even to be born with. Like it's kind of it's sticking on us. Like you know, it's, sometimes it's so frustrating. No, to uh, you know, how, what's your best advice to access to this light body? I, I know it's the paintings and the right. sacred. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. So that first is the awareness, uh -huh. and this is what the Tibetans teach. First, you have to be directly introduced to your true nature. And that to them is the value of the painting. So that they show you, this is what our true self looks like. This is what our blueprint looks like. Get detached from the physical self and begin to have a concept of your light body self. So first you imagine it. Then the second thing you have to do is you have to believe it. Mm -hmm. You have to begin to then say, okay, this is the, the, there's a larger reality for me. And then you have to continue to live in that state. So you, you imagine it, you believe it, then you live your life as much as you can from the perspective of the light body, that mm -hmm. you're actually, the, all your daily actions, your emotions are either assisting you and feeding your, your true eternal nature, or you're not. And once you shift your perspective, it, it begins to alter your choices. Can we replace light body with soul? I, I do think they're interchangeable. I do. I'm a, a, a Gnostic. Some people would say I'm a Christian Gnostic. Maybe those terms go together. Maybe they don't. <laughs> but the Gnostics believe that our soul is a divine spark. That is a, it's like a flicker of a flame of our true soul. And that our entire soul does not incarnate on earth. Just a small portion of it incarnates on earth and manifests this physical body as a vehicle for entertainment for working out karma it's a missionary of light and love from our creator and then part of our goal is to wake up and realize that this is this world is sort of an illusion and that, that our greater self still remains in with the, in the realm of the creator in yeah. base reality what buddhists called uh, living up to our true nature yes exactly and then and by definition to the buddhas our true nature is the rainbow light body when they yeah. want to display it that's what they show Maybe that's why I have the rainbow. <laughs> I never really knew. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, there you go. And maybe that's why the rainbow is such an important motif in our world now. It's, it's not just about overcoming certain gender or race or religion. It's about recognizing our true nature as, as humans. Yeah, there seems to be uh, the unity in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, it's, so we are divine? Absolutely. I mean, that is How the... How divine are we? I mean, tell us. We want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, there's nothing that can take away from our divinity. I mean, we're born that way, and we just step into this world and sometimes get lost, and part of the awakening is to recognize our, our, true, our true nature. Yeah, Th those challenges, those hard times, those things that we're encountering right now that are really shaking us up, that we feel is happening, even that astrologues and, uh, talk about, it's, it's, uh, it's serving the good. Right. Ultimately, because, I mean, if we're a, a very strong and powerful spiritual being, we're coming into our realm, 
it's sort of like the, the analogy of a boxer. If a boxer is getting prepared for a championship fight, he's, he's not going to go wanting to spar or practice with a weakling. He's going to want to spar with someone who's equally stronger, if not stronger, than he or she is in order to prepare. And that is, is part of the value of the challenges that we have in this world, mm -hmm. is that the bigger the challenge, the greater the reward. Yeah. Going back to ETs, so can we talk about inter-terrestrial uh, also beings? that are trying to communicate are just ETs outside of Earth. And by interterrestrial, do you mean those that live in the inner Earth? Or, um, you know, I don't have a lot of familiarity with the... Yeah. With I was the, just wondering if you had. So. No. Okay, mm -mm. no. No. I remember with Drew, Drew Vallo, Melchizedek, he referred to those beings inside Earth, and he would, oh. tr through uh, Merkabas, get inside and, and, and visit them and have some information. So I thought it was interesting, since we speak about the universe getting smaller and smaller and smaller within us and larger outside, so I thought right. there might be some huge knowledge there, too. Right, yeah, very interesting. You know, I, I've written extensively about the Essenes and their Merkaba teachings, and they're always going out yeah. as opposed to into the inner Earth, yeah. so... So they're they're so ETs are sharing with us information. They're watching. They're trying to be in contact. Uh, what would they like ideally? Because it feels like we're not quite ready. Otherwise, it creates a huge boom on Earth. Huh? I know it's it's it, when you think about the circumstance of imagine you're an extraterrestrial civilization and you're you're coming to Earth and you you're not going to first of all you're not going to negotiate with 195 separate countries <laughs> and so therefore you have this huge movement now for globalization yeah. single world government very scary to some people including myself sometimes but i see it all as stepping stones towards this this moment of disclosure when we recognize that hey we're we're plugged into a, a cosmic reality mm -hmm. and that's something also that the tibetans talk about with the rainbow light body teaching that mm -hmm. i think is very interesting is that they they say that this rainbow body teaching is taught in 13 star systems including our own mm -hmm. which suggests that from the ancient times they thought of earth as part of a like a federation of star systems where this light body teaching is taught mm -hmm. And then once we attain the light body, we can travel to any of these other star systems and then reform a physical body if that's what we choose to do. Do you recall some of those moments? Do you uh, every day have this experience like some people are, t are talking about or remember? No, I'm not an experiencer. I wish I was. I mean, people, people, they always ask, what did, where were your past lives? And do you remember being in this life? And I, I, I don't. I don't so where know. does it come from for you? When did you really get like there's something there that I know is true? Uh, well, I started, uh, well, I started actually in 1982 reading about the Cathars, and I did have a, a real sense of, okay, they, they were really plugged into truth. They, they claimed that they were reincarnations of the Essenes, they lived in southern France, and they were, of course, persecuted by the, the Catholic Church and wiped out in mass. And I just knew the moment I read about the Cathars, I was 19 years old, that this was very, very important information and mm -hmm. continue to follow that path ever since. Yeah, because when we speak, uh, since the New York Times says you're a groovy investigator, you know, of the mythology, then right. then there's like, and I remember having this conversation with Joe Dispenza many times on mysticism and all that, and we speak about the third eye and the opening and neuroscience, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're impressed, you seem impressed by Joe's work. Sure. But th what I love and why I'm impressed by his work is because he's he's about action and experiencing it. Yes. So you probably do some crazy stuff that I want to hear about on how to experience these light bodies. It's not just theory. Yeah, no, you're right. And I I teach people that it's attaining the light body and perfection is really about becoming more whole, more holy, more complete, more compassionate. That's what the word perfection yes. actually meant in the ancient world. Perfection, wholeness is symbolized by a circle, which is 360 degrees. And so then the question becomes, on a scale of zero to 360, with 360 being whole, holy, and complete, where are we at? Mm -hmm. And for every individual, that's going to be a different number. Mm -hmm. But I think we all start out at least two-thirds divine. That, mm -hmm. That's what the Epic of Gilgamesh says. It's the second oldest human story. And it's an ascension story. Gilgamesh is a Sumerian king. It's about 2200 BC. He's told by a goddess, Inanna, that he's two-thirds divine and one-third human. And, and if he wants to get through the gate of the gods, which is ultimately all of our, our goal, that's our ascension, then he's got to become more whole and more complete. So if we all start out at, say, 240 out of 360, then we have to figure out how to become more whole. And the way we do that is by realizing that Every day we're doing certain things mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally that reflect our belief that we're at this particular number, mm -hmm. 240 out of 360. And so the object then is to begin to 
connect with yourself, what will you be doing differently when you're at, say, 270 or 280, 290? And then to start doing those new things mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally that reflect that. And this is how you gradually raise your frequency and work towards that wholeness or holiness. As our frequency rise, uh, our color, our aura changes and get lighter. Is that, I mean, the rainbow, talking about rainbow colors, we go through those colors ourselves and experience them? Or what's the correlation between the color and our evolution and frequency? Um, well, you know, actually, the rainbow light body is a is more of a, a moment. It is a, an instantaneous yeah. dissolution, a dissolving of the body into, into rainbow light. Yeah. But along the way, it's about the increasing of our frequency yeah. to get to that moment. Yeah. So I was wondering, because we see sometimes some aura, they get very lighter. And as, as we increase in frequency, we get wider. And right. there's this white kind of aura around the Christ or Buddha-like or avatars. Yeah, yeah absolutely. This is why uh, the Essenes, for example, wore their white linen robes. It was, it was a symbol of their desire to attain that, that level of purity. And I personally, I think that the, the they wear the white robes also because when you mix all the colors of the rainbow together, what do you get? You get white, uh -huh. and so it's it's actually a mixture of all yeah. all of those colors. Yeah, there's just something amazing about those colors. Um, I've lost my question. I had another thought there that just went. Bleep. I guess it'll come back, but uh, um, the light bodies. Um, is there something else that you want to add to there? I've lost my thought for some reason regarding the colors or yeah. frequencies because... Yeah, just will people be changing colors or frequencies as they raise their vibration? Yeah. And yeah, I think you're definitely going to be attracted to higher vibrations as you're, as you're raising your frequency. And that might be reflective in the clothes that you wear, the way you present yourself. It's, it's about identifying with those higher frequencies. Yeah. And, and you haven't mentioned yet the feminine, oh. the, this rays of the feminine and how you speak about male avatars. Right. But how about the female yeah. avatars and the, the goddesses out there waking sure. up to their light bodies? Yeah, I'm always seeking images for of the divine feminine, Ishtara, for example, uh, the white Tara in Buddhism, Mary. The Mother Mary in, in Christian mysticism was the first Christian to ascend. So the, there are plenty of female. Mary Magdalene? Mary Magdalene ascended as well. These are very important stories and, and, and guides, actually, because they, they actually become the story of Mary Magdalene and her ascension, the Mother Mary's ascension, and her ability to phase in and out as a light being in her apparitions, be it at Lourdes or in Mexico City as Our Lady of Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. These are all examples of Mary going through her ascension and then phasing back into this reality as a light being and being presented as such in, in Christian art. And these effectively become the stories in a way are ascension, I call them ascension simulation texts because as you tune into these stories, be it from a masculine or feminine perspective, you're, you're actually plugging into that consciousness and you're calling in Mary or the Magdalene as, as an avatar. Usually when they make those appearances, it was for miracles or it would shift people's consciousness. Or I remember just uh, before giving, uh, being uh, pregnant, I saw Mary and I felt unconditional love. And it was just very powerful. It's like instant healing and uh, yes. instant uh, purification. Right. Then it comes back. But anyway, <laughs> there's, there's something. So why do we have that capacity to be somewhere else and do also those apparitions and support other beings, whether it's families or humanity or yeah. we have all that capacity? Oh, absolutely. And that's part. This is our natural capability. I mean, it sounds crazy to some people to think, oh, you can dissolve your flesh and blood body into light and then maybe travel somewhere else in the cosmos or on the earth and then reform your physical body if that's the way you choose to express the greatest amount of compassion. That's what the Buddhists teach. And that seems really odd to us, but actually that is a, a totally normal and natural human capacity. And that's what we're, we're trying to get back into. And again, at this time, we're at a risk of losing that through transhumanism and simulation technology that is saying, you know, you really don't want one of these bodies anyway. It's just information. So why don't we just copy and paste the contents of your brain into this computer avatar, this cartoon avatar living in a simulated reality, and that will be your ascension. And that is what's on the table right now from Silicon Valley. It's a total counterfeit version of what the ancients taught about ascension. And uh, dying, of course, the Buddhists prepare for this moment of dying, of the ascension, right. this... Mm -hmm. 
is there what can we what can we do uh, ourselves to prepare for this for this moment i guess if we're not uh, you know we're regular practices i would say non-religious practices right well part of what and again what i try to present is this is the ancient model this is what they did this is what the cathars did this is what the the essenes did for example they they used these texts like the ascension of isaiah and other such texts literally as simulation text. They would rehearse over and over and over again. Like mantras. Like mantras. So they knew exactly what was going to happen in the afterlife. The Native Americans call it the path of souls. And virtually every Native American tribe, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, where okay. this path of souls teaching reached its zenith in ancient America. A thousand years ago, people came to Nashville to, to learn the path of souls. And, and the message here is that the afterlife is well mapped and, and navigatable. Uh -huh. And all you need to do is start to plug into some of these ancient teachings, trust them, and begin to rehearse what's going to happen in the afterlife. That's what the Native Americans did, the Essenes, Cathars, the Egyptians. They all did the same thing. And it's very surprising, comfortably surprising, how closely they all match mm -hmm. in terms of what happens after we die. Go through the light, go through Orion's belt, go on to the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and off you go. You know, I interviewed Wayne Dyer back then in Hawaii, Dolores Cannon, Dr. Emoto, they passed away, like, uh, in France, too, I've interviewed many people that just passed all of a sudden, and it's like out of nowhere, you know, right. I mean, Wayne was maybe 75 years old, right. Dolores Cannon, too, mm -hmm. Dr. Emoto, you know, th that did the crystals of water with a... Sure. Also, what happens there? I mean, when do we die? Is it people say it's when we're like kind of ready to go and move to our light beings? Is that the, I mean, what's what's that timing? I'm like, I had some more interviews to do with you, Wayne. Where are you? Right, I know. Well, he's here, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And we can communicate with Wayne. And I take great comfort in those stories of people when they have dreams about deceased loved ones. They're they're not really. They're just not in present in physical form any longer they've gone into a, a different realm of consciousness yeah. but they're still here but but why that moment why that early is that because he had done everything that he was supposed to on earth you know tom petty yeah. another example he finishes a world tour his last tour he says i'm retiring this is it he goes home the next day he's getting ready for hip surgery and he overdoses on pain medication How, why yeah. did he finish his his whole life mission is, is that what it's about or I you know I, I collect weird death stories too I love weird death stories mm -hmm. uh, the, the bride in Chicago uh, standing out front of the church get after just getting married a gargoyle falls off the church and kills her mm. I mean what what's that all about yeah. I mean it's just so yeah, strange especially with people with some people that have done so many great things like our friend 40 years old a few months ago in car accident i mean he was like all about natural agriculture and permaculture and all those beautiful things and then right. the, at 40 you know and he, he was like a beacon of light why those go right exactly but i personally think that we we are, are the moment of our death is is known we might not know it but it, it's gonna happen it's gonna it's i mean so we it, do have a destiny I, I believe that we do, and I think we have chosen our, our manner of death, and sometimes it's very creative, and it's, it's very difficult and sad for the people that are left behind, but for those that go on, it's the moment of greatest joy for them. Mm. So then they'll reincarnate. It, for what? Somewhere else, right, exactly. For the soul to re-experience some other things and to lift off karma. You haven't mentioned karma, but could we say that that's darker... Yeah. Stuff or yeah, I mean that's part of the reason why we incarnate is to, to work out that karma, but also primarily as a messenger from our, our creator. Mm. Last little word about light bodies or something that you want to say within this conversation. It was great, by the way. I really enjoyed this, and I'm sure all the co-creators watching. Is there something else that you that is important to say? Yeah, it's just it's a it's a wonderful teaching to get involved in. If you've never looked at it before, it might seem wow that that makes sense because you know about chakras, you might know about auras, and now this is like the next step. It's it's the ultimate step in our spiritual understanding on Earth. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, William. Pleasure to do another interview on some other maybe aspects or part of these teachings. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.
Big big kisses to all of you juicy co-creators, big kiss from London from this delicious conference organized by Richard from TCH, TCCHE, -E, something like that. <laughs> We're at the Millennium Hotel and I'm off to interviewing Greg Braden and Joe Dispenza and Asima Ramain. It's always a pleasure to meet them and to do those interviews. Thank you so much Thank for sharing you. your knowledge. Thank you. Much love. Bye-bye. <laughs>